Welcome to the new school and to this panel. We're very excited about the speakers, the theme, and we're actually very happy that so many of you are here, considering that the US Ghana match is <laughs> happening at the same time. I had many people emailing me saying, uh, very interesting, but no thank you. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, my name is Fabio Parasecoli. And I am the coordinator of the Food Studies program here at the New School. Uh, the program started in 2008, and it has developed into a pretty nice series, uh, I mean, nice set of courses ranging from history to culture, media, policy, the environment. And starting from the fall, we actually offer a bachelor's degree in food studies and a minor in food studies. We're very excited about that. And we're working on new projects, including a cluster of classes on food and design that will also start in the fall. So things are happening uh, fast. In the tradition of the new school, we are really happy about organizing public events. We think that the conversation with the community needs to go on on important themes. So we have most of the events taped. If you're interested, you can find them on our website, uh, The Inquisitive Eater. It's inquisitiveeater.com. And we have an archive with all the videos past. Also, talking about the, the website, we welcome submissions from anybody. Uh, submissions in poetry, uh, visual arts, uh, theory, everybody's welcome. And the website explains uh, the, the rules and the, the guidelines for submission. So before we uh, start today, uh, I'd like to uh, say that this event is co-sponsored uh, with uh, the SOFAB Institute, the Southern Food and Beverage Museum uh, in New Orleans. I mean, they're based in New Orleans, but it's becoming a, a large national um, organization. And so here uh, we have a Babi Didarian uh, who will say a few words about the museum. Uh, Babi is a travel food and spa editor for Splash Magazine Worldwide, the publisher of Travel Beyond Expectation, a presenter of wellness workshops around the world, and the public relations and marketing director of the SOFAB Institute and Museums. Her role is to develop and curate Flavors of the World multimedia exhibitions and events. And Babi will tell a few words about what SOFAB is. Liz Williams, who is the founder of SOFAB Institute, is in Russia right now because the State Department has sent the founder and president of the museum and the institute with the chef from the restaurant to help promote wellness and New Orleans in Russia of all places. So I am here in Liz's space. Um, the museum is in New Orleans. We are opening a new 30,000 square foot facility, uh, cutting the ribbon on September 29th. Uh, we hope that all of you will find your way to New Orleans. We will have many exciting hands-on um, exhibitions, food tastings from around the world. And my role is to gather uh, food so we can better educate people as to where the source of food is, which is the mission of the museum. And of course, it relates to health and the subject matter that's being discussed today. Uh, in addition to the museum being in New Orleans, uh, it is working with people like Fabio here in New York and in LA to bring the message that health is something that is the one thing that we all can get together on regardless of our religious beliefs and health is the one thing we can hold hands and just enjoy being alive and all the bounties of being alive. So I hope uh, I'm going to listen very carefully to today. And um, I do travel the world, and I have spent many, many moments learning about wellness and health and obesity. And I want to leave you with one interesting thought, and that is that the museum 
because we believe in the future is our children, as many of you do. So we have just um, appointed a kid chef ambassador. And so the, her position is to educate through all many, many events we have there, here, in LA, to uh, educate children on healthy eating, healthy living, and hopefully starting young, we can win the battle of obesity and all of us have a better, healthier life. So thank you for being here tonight and enjoy. I just want to mention that we are organizing another event in the fall together on what's the family meal, is that a myth, is that reality, how it's been used you know, uh, in, in contemporary discourse. So that's going to happen in October. If you're interested in future events, please uh, leave us your uh, email address and we'll make sure to stay in touch. So let me introduce uh, the speakers. Uh, who I know very well and very glad they accepted to be on this panel. From your left, uh, you have uh, uh, Leah Sweet. She's assistant professor of art history here at Parsons. Uh, she works on 20th century art, in, including performance art, and on the interactions of art history with fat studies, uh, queer theory, and disability studies. Uh, recently, she had an article published on fat studies about uh, the Rubenesque in popular visual culture. Next one, <clears throat> sorry, is Christina Russo. She's assistant professor of public health education at Turo College. She works on food access and food insecurity in low income communities uh, in a food justice framework. She also had an article recently published on the Journal of Critical Thought and Practice called Searching for Food Justice. Next one is Lisa Rubin, Associate Professor of Psychology here at NSSR and NSPE, two of the divisions of the New School. Uh, her work focuses on body image and psychology. Uh, she's published on issues of race, feminism, pregnancy, body image, uh, one of our articles is Whatever Feels Good in My Soul, uh, from the India Irie song, on culture, medicine, and psychiatry. And she has an article on a new book that came out recently, right? On reconstructing obesity, which is uh, one of the, the topics we're going to discuss uh, today. And then we have Natalia Melman Petrezella, who's assistant professor of history here at Lang College. And NSSR too? No. And Lang College. Uh, that's new school stuff. Uh, she's the founder of Health uh, Class 2.0, an experiential wellness education program. Um, her, her new book is coming out called Classroom Wars, published by Oxford. And it's about over the sex and bilingual education here in the US. And now she will have the chance of do research on wellness culture in the US for a new book. So I would like to start by asking each of the speakers what, how they got to this topic of fat studies and what their approach is. Maybe I can start very briefly. I'm both the moderator, but I'm also a participant. I started working on this topic looking at uh, analysis of pop culture. I, I work on media and communication, and particularly popular culture. And I started looking at representations of uh, fatness in movies, mostly, uh, both male and female. And I was very interested, for instance, in the whole phenomenon of the black man in fat drag in comedies. And um, for me, what was really interesting is how body image, race uh, intersected in very interesting ways. And, and that started my, my reflection on the topic. And I was telling my colleagues here, I just finished writing an essay on uh, Babel-based diets, uh, also for the journal Fat Studies, which is actually a very interesting journal. You might want to look into it. I think it's the only one in the US that actually uh, deals specifically with this topic, right? A couple of people have published 
fat studies things everywhere. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. So that's that was my entrance into into this topic. Leah, um, and I'll sit down. Is this working? Um, so my entry entry to working into fat studies was essentially reading the, the fat studies reader, and that had a, an absolute. A fundamental role in integrating the what fat studies is as an academic is discipline into my academic interests. Um, so, for me, giving the kind of academic rigor to questions that are kind of put often very individually and personally was something that was a very intriguing. I think the idea of you know what I well I uh, will get into that later mm -hmm. but uh, but then having this idea of seeing literally fat studies as something that studies constructions of fat how those constructions exist and who they serve to be able to understand the larger systemic issues was for me both personally and academically quite crucial so that's kind of how mm -hmm. I got into it Christina um, and my research is largely around food access in low-income communities, and as part of that, it's certainly implicated in um, obesity epidemic discourse. Um, but what I found through my research is that having this very weight-centered biomedical construction of health serves to gloss over the very important structural issues of um, socioeconomic inequality that actually produce um, lots of different kinds of conditions that are more, I think, importantly and closely associated with ill health and excess death. So my next project is really going to explore the ways in which obesity epidemic discourse is um, utilized in major public health and medical journals to see how that continues to collapse and conflate these issues of weight-centeredness and health outcomes as opposed to these more fundamental causes of health. Um, but yeah, my entry into this topic came as a, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, um, and came through an interest in eating problems, so, uh, and, and wanting to understand better a range of issues, uh, but, uh, specifically seeing through both clinical work as well as research the ways in which um, you know, we, we can't separate out issues of, of um, essentially fat stigma, weight phobia, um, fat phobia, body phobia, um, from issues of anorexia, bulimia, and I'm seeing these as, as all interconnected. So, so wanting to understand how people, uh, you know, on the one hand, how people come to dislike their bodies and how um, uh, you know, how fat stigma contributes to that, and wanting to understand how people can come to, to like their bodies and appreciate their bodies. Um, so, so that sort of brought me into this world and um, you know, with some of my initial research trying to look into weightism, fat stigma, um, and, uh, and as well as, like I said, the flip side, trying to understand better how people can celebrate their bodies, live in their bodies, enjoy their bodies, regardless of their body size. And you know, has brought me, in some ways, I don't know if, uh, I think work in, for many people, I think work in uh, exposure to queer theory and disability studies has brought them into fat studies. And I think because I was doing earlier work probably in fat studies, it introduced me to the ways in which queer studies, fat studies, um, uh, and uh, uh, disability studies, among others, are all interconnected in ways that we'll talk more about. So. Yeah, I, my experience picks up on much of what's been said already, but I, um, it's interesting because I came up, I was trained in history, as Fabio mentioned, but I came up very much in a feminist studies uh, background, and through all of my years in graduate school, fat as a category of analysis was really not something that came up. This was in the early um, 2000s. And um, it wasn't something that I noticed wasn't there, which shows the kind of blinders that we have on, but then as I um, kind of got more deeply interested academically in these issues, I started thinking, you know, exploring this stuff myself. And then to me, it was also a kind of activist piece that pushed me back into the scholarly research where I came to be interested in kind of wellness education as it was and wasn't being um, carried out around Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign. And I just couldn't believe how uncritically people accepted this idea of obesity as the center of kind of all evil. And I say evil with all the moral value that we attach <laughs> to that word, right? And so that kind of got me interested 
um, in, in, in looking at this in a more scholarly way. And then I'll say also to, to Lisa's point about how we can get to, how we get to dislike our bodies or to like our bodies that I'd been working sort of at the time, very much outside of academia, in fitness and in the kind of mind-body world. And I like to think that this discourse of love your body and you know wellness has replaced some of the sort of thin thighs and 30 days talk, but I couldn't believe how close beneath the surface this kind of fat stigma and fat hatred still permeates even in the kind of like better parts of that world. So that kind of all brought me to this. Yeah, and for, I started more or less from the same thoughts, but I, I, I looked more specifically at issues of masculinity. Very often we think of uh, weight problems connected with women. But actually, that's, that's not the case. And the more you, you look closely at production of public debates and uh, uh, popular culture, you realize that also men now are really worried about their bodies and have problems identifying with their bodies. As a professor here, I deal with many students that at 18, 19, 20 already have sort of dysmorphia in, in a way they, they cannot identify w with with their bodies. It's sort of living, uh, occupying a space that's not really yours. And uh, many react with, you know, with the gym craziness in a way. So extreme works out, works out, workouts um, that really impact their capacity of socializing in a normal way. Um, if you're a bodybuilder, I don't know if you're aware about this, you cannot really eat whatever you want whenever you want. It's a very strict diet. And so for 18, an 18, 19 year old, that means that very often they cannot hang out with their friends because it means going out and not being able to partake with the others because otherwise it breaks your, your cycle of, of nutrition. And there is this development of what now sometimes is referred to as ortho orthorexia. Mm -hmm. So the, the desire of eating just the right stuff, the connection between this and body image for young men is uh, quite scary. Uh, I think, and I think all of us as educators have to also deal with you know wh what's happening there. But let's go back to the, the theme itself. Um, when you say fat studies, many people are a little surprised because precisely because of the stigma we were mentioning. So, what's the significance of the name itself, and uh, how did it? get reclaimed the way it is now in FET studies? Um, well, I just want to say, I was thinking about this question and how to kind of break it down um, in the idea of the name fat studies. It's not obesity studies. It is fat studies. And, the, uh, and first of all, the point of reclaiming the word fat certainly uh, goes into the reclaiming of a lot of different words like queer, exactly, you know, et cetera, to say fat is a descriptor. People are thin, people are fat, people are tall, people are short. It's the negative connotations that we attach to the word fat that do the damage. When I refer to myself, I say I am fat because I'm fat and I have no issue with that. So for me, when I think of fat studies, it is you know, then the way that I articulate this sometimes to uh, my students and other people is um, looking at the, as I said before, the idea of fat as a construction. Mm -hmm. So it is, well, how is fat being defined by whom and in what context? Uh, along with you know the juxtaposition of fat and obesity, who uh, what you know uh, kind of commodification or medicalization happens when we use words like obesity versus fat? What kind of structures are in place that benefit from the construction of obesity versus using fatness? Because we certainly all know that feeling you know at home in your own body and saying I'm happy and I'm fat doesn't make money for anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea of who is defining fatness for whom and who benefits and who is disenfranchised by this, that is the work of fat studies, to look at the kind of paradigms, value systems that are in place 
not looking at it as, as something that needs to be solved, but understanding how within the wider, uh, as a wider construct, what are the basic um, assumptions in play and how can we study and investigate those? Mm -hmm. And how about the other disciplines? Because here we have environmental psychology, we have psychology, we have history. Mm -hmm. How is fat, or fat studies framed in well, what you do? I think along the lines of what Leah is saying, I'm looking at the issue of the of language like obesity and overweight as this effort towards medicalization of the body. And through that medicalization, it implies an attainable, normal, or ideal weight. So it erases the diversity of body size, body type, the diversity of people, in, and at the same time reinforces these kinds of clearly, you know, special interest driven, certainly not outside of uh, larger market economies, uh, interests that um, produce things like the war on obesity, which was um, part of the Shape Up uh, initiative that um, the Surgeon General in the mid 90s um, used. He actually used the term war on obesity. And at the same time, a lot of these studies were being funded by pharmaceutical industries that were very much invested in uh, a lot of these diets and treatments for what was associated with or correlated with weight-related uh, issues. So I think that in the same ways, you know, these um, processes that lead health and body type and being very weight-centered need to be interrogated. And at least with my students, I try to, again, introduce notions of social construction and the body as being socially constructed and that ways in which we think about health and disease as socially constructed and needing to be challenged and deconstructed. Mm -hmm. I think with regard to psychology, I think psychology sits in this, in this ambivalent place around, um, I mean, you know, I came to this field through, um, through femi feminist psychology, so not, not mainstream psychology, not, not uh, the predominant lens that's offered in psychology necessarily. But um, so on the one hand, right, we have, uh, you know, from the clinical end, we want people to, to be comfortable with themselves, to accept themselves. And on the other hand, we, you know, uh, also want people to, I mean, so it's probably partly the paradox of what we do as psychologists, and we want people to improve upon themselves, and we have ideas about what that means that come from, uh, from the culture. And so I think that um, psychology is, on the one hand, interested in you know, social psychology issues of stigma, and this is as an important area of stigma, understanding the consequences of stigma, discrimination, um, uh, and, you know, and, and the research you know, that finds us, and I can talk at some about, uh, about that, um, you know, is, is profound and eye-opening. And I, and I think, um, and on the one hand, you know, there is, because psychology has such a strong need to, you know, we're, we're you know, ambivalent about whether we're a natural science or a social science, and, you know, we want our NIH funding, you know, which means that we're driven by the NIH agenda. Mm -hmm. We sometimes partner even mm -hmm. with pharma. And mm -hmm. so, you know, so, so I think that there is this tension in the field around, um, you know, th that, that sometimes bubbles up, and, and it depends on which communities you're in whether, um, you know, where the work is being done to, to deconstruct these issues and understand, wait a minute, have I started using weight as, an, as you know, um, sort of the equivalent of health and what do I mean by health and how, you know, how have, um, uh, how have the numbers started to shift and, you know, re not really sort of um, very conscientiously thinking about the constructs that we're using. Um, and, uh, and then I also think that there's uh, a big camp looking at that. So, well, there's a larger camp not looking at it. <coughs> but, uh, but I think that there's, uh, there's more and more folks who, um, uh, you know, who are, and I think uh, in a variety of ways, whether we're looking at, you know, whether looking at structural mm -hmm. issues. Um, but I think there, there is, there's a lot of um, contradictions in, in the field mm -hmm. of psychology around these issues. Um, so to speak to kind of history and education, where I've, I've sat in both fields. So in history, it's interesting. And I think the name, the way you pose the question, the naming of fat studies is so important because it really kind of hits you in the face with what the focus is. And um, for a long time, people in history have been looking at diet culture and kind of history of the body. And um, so that's kind of nothing new in terms of the analytical lens. But it, ha it, it it's fairly new to be called fat studies in any way. And I've had conversations 
conversations with like people who consider them histori and themselves historians of gender who see the fat studies reader on my shelf and are like, oh, now I've heard it all, kind of thing. Like as if like this is like, what is this like crazy new thing? In a way that I imagine in the 1970s, things like you know women's studies might have been uh, uh, thought of like that at, at, at one point. So there's that dimension where I think a lot of the work has been done, but naming it as such, which is a big deal, especially if you think the way we package books or courses or any of these other things. The naming is new and I think very important. Um, from the perspective of education, I think that some of the issues that Lisa raises are, are just spot on and come up with me as I think about how to frame my own wellness education thing that so often, like anything, there's a lot of energy around wellness in schools and health in schools, but so often, like the proxy for that becomes kind of, you know, trashing fat bodies as the embodiment of everything wrong with that community, which to me is deeply, deeply problematic. So, but then you have that tension of like, well, I really want the support of this group. How much am I going to fight to say, no, you really can't say a obesity epidemic as the thing that we're targeting and that's, you know, going to be a teachable moment or do you just lose that support that you might have gotten? So it's, I think, a tension that, that really exists. And how do your students in the wellness class react to this way of rethinking body image and weight? So I guess we're going to so yeah. for me, so, um, so I, I have taught this class called um, Wellness in American Culture, and we really we start in the um, you know uh, even talking about Descartes and kind of mind body dualism and thinking about the way that this stuff works. And the students, and I mean most of you know whether you're officially part of a new school or just here tonight, like this is like a group that considers themselves rightly so a pretty radical avant-garde crew. They're very um, you, they are very kind of sensitive to issues of race, class, gender, the way they talk the way they frame things. I assigned the fat studies reader and it's like, oh, like I didn't even know this was something to think about. Or if it was something to think about, the politically correct way to speak would be to call someone overweight, not fat. Because that, but that's actually like way more offensive if you have a fat studies perspective on things, right? Because overweight suggests there's a weight everyone should be and you're over it. As opposed to saying fat is just fat, you know? Own it. So I think that the, to the students, and they fight about it. They don't all think this is sort of a good framework, mm -hmm. but it's like a very, no one is sleeping in that class ever. <laughs> and how about in the wellness class that you teach in high school? Oh, in the high school is actually in there. So there we, I mean, these uh, First of all, explain oh, what yeah. you so, do. So Health Class 2.0, my idea there, it's an experiential wellness education course. So, uh, program. So college students at Lang, we go into New York City schools. Most of them would be, all of them really would be considered under-resourced in one way or another. And the idea is that in every session, the kids eat, exercise, and engage. So they do, they eat some kind of healthier option food, which we have donated from a variety of places. They um, exercise in this practice called intensati, which combines affirmations with exercise. So the idea is to make exercise not about punishment or restriction um, or deprivation, but to actually have it be a positive experience. And they engage, hopefully throughout, both in connecting, um, the in having a conversation about the food that they're eating, so that it's mindful eating. There's a nutrition dimension to it, but we're very deliberate to connect it to a kind of food systems discussion too. So it's not just like, you should have more vegetables, but why are there not that many vegetables? vegetables in your neighborhood. What can you do as a kid, right? Your cafeteria is a food system. You guys could have a petition, etc. What do you want? How does that taste? Food is supposed to be a sensory thing, not instructions, right, on what you should and shouldn't do. So um, with the fat question mm -hmm. specifically, it's one of the most, um, the day we specifically focus on that. And the idea is um, getting away from the idea of good fat and bad fat, which you hear so much, right? Both in terms of nutritionally of the idea that are some things that are sort of, you know, a moral evil that you shouldn't ever eat, which I think is a really damaging perspective, but also in how one looks at oneself, right? When you look in the mirror, how would you describe yourself? What do you think's good? Do you ever think something's kind of bad? And moving away from that to look at who you are and to find something kind of positive in any of that. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a nutshell. Yeah. It goes over pretty well, and it's pretty shocking because so much of the discourse in these schools, again, is about obesity and diabetes. You're sick, you're fat, that means you're ugly, and you've got problems. And so we try mm -hmm. to reframe that. <coughs> How about the psychological, psychologic, psychology students, sorry? Um, you know, it's, I, th I think, because I'm teaching this in the context of a gender studies course mm -hmm. often, um, uh, it, students um, 
are relating well to it because because I think many of them can identify with um, well actually let me say so I think uh, uh, I, but I, yeah many of them can enter the conversation through um, uh, through concern about media representation certainly um, as particularly around women's bodies um, increasingly so um, recognizing. Uh, recognizing this as a broader issue, not just a women's issue, and uh, so, but I think oftentimes it, it, the 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 discourse of health um, shifts into you know uh, the discourse of the media shifts into the discourse of health shifts into discourses of blame. So I think people are sort of back and forth with on the one hand really viewing these issues as oppressive concerns that they live on a daily basis on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, <coughs> there are sometimes being tensions in that class. That's in the context of a psychology of gender, mm -hmm, of course. Mm -hmm. um, in a, you know, I think where things become more complicated um, for students probably are, are the clinical doctoral students that I'm working with who may be working in health centers where their job is to do bariatric screening. And that's a major, um, a money maker for the center they're working at, and there isn't much. Um, they're not given much critical training mm -hmm. around around this issue. Um, so I think that it depends on yeah. So which students you know? Because I'm working with both graduate students and undergraduates, mm -hmm. um, and dealing with this either at a very medical clinical level or dealing with it um, in in a more sort of academic conversation. Yeah. The, the issues are, are quite different, but um, yeah. And Christina, you work with clinical students, right? I do right? work with clinical students in a graduate professional program teaching public health. And so I'm very much enmeshed in the language of obesity and the obesity epidemic. So it's a huge struggle. There's um, this sort of priming for the students to come in with this very biomedical construction of the person, which often relates to or the consequence of which is the sense of personal responsibility that um, these issues are produced through lifestyle and choices and that they need to be navigated. Um, and what I really work to do is try to kind of push them further upstream in the upstream downstream uh, metaphor of public mm -hmm. health to stop looking at bodies as these um, disciplining sites, which is really what these clinicians are sort of training to do and look at a more systems approach and reframing health and public health discourse around weight so it's less weight centered and looking at it to be more fitness centered and about well-being and how does one feel and how is one able to access and navigate the various parts of their life um, as well as trying to be more critical about the the structures that produce illness and death in, in a particular community or across communities. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a real struggle because I think, especially with clinical students, um, their primary tools are tools of medicine. And so thinking about these broader social or critical issues becomes very foreign and uncomfortable to them. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's a continuous struggle, but uh, the work is really about decoupling weight from health and making them look at critical, broader, contextual issues that are attached to fat bodies that they don't normally see or don't even recognize the ways in which they're stigmatizing or othering them and trying to help them identify stigma, especially in the healthcare context, as a barrier to access of healthcare, which is something that they learn in a social determinants of class, that health of class, that if patients are uncomfortable or feel othered or stigmatized by their providers, they're not going to seek care. And that's one of the major issues or consequences of ill health in people who may be labeled as obese or overweight, the people that we're talking about as fat, because they're feeling um, oppressed by or discriminated against by the people who are supposed to be taking care of them. And so hmm. one of the ways in which I try to engage them is to look at the ways in which they may be carrying biases or stigma around with them as well. Wow. Uh, Leah, you work on art history, visual culture, so how do we approach that with your students? Well, my students are primarily um, a Parsons, so they're designers, they're artists, they might be photographers, they might be into architecture, fashion, um, any kind of aspect of design. So I try to uh, instill in them a kind of understanding of different kinds of bodies and the idea of 
what is often seen as a kind of a standard or normative body in design and all the bodies that kind of don't fit into that schema. So I am... I very much hope in the classroom <laughs> that through uh, that through my teaching that at least opens their eyes up to the idea of when they go out and create signage, when they go out and create furniture or public spaces, that they're thinking about how design can either empower or disenfranchise people, and that design is actually a very powerful tool that the physical um, space that we live in, the kind of images we encounter, are very powerful. So I actually, um, like Lisa was saying, teach fat studies ideas through different contexts. There's, there's as of yet, have not taught a dedicated fat studies class. Although, uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, and then also teaching here at the New School, the idea of working through different kinds of ideas of people, identities, oppressions. Um, I've taught, for example, a self-portraiture class uh, with the idea of thinking, how do artists construct, how does one construct a self? How does one depict a self? How does one self-identify? The power of self-identification and representation. So we walk through race, we walk through, walk through gender, we walk through class, we walk through all these kinds of ideas of artists confronting these issues and depicting these in different ways or engaging with them in self-portraits. And then the idea, finally, of talking about kind of non-normative bodies in a fat way um, of looking at Jenny Saville or looking um, at um, all other artists, Lucian Freud, other people who have created bodies that might be seen as disgusting, and then working from that through there to kind of think about how that happens. Um, but I also do tangible things to kind of get them out of their own bodies in the sense of when you have, say, a whole you know, 18, 18 year olds, um, especially at Parsons, interestingly enough, not a lot of them have bodies that visibly, and I don't know all of their circumstances, so I'll say that caveat right there, fit into, that do not fit into a kind of normative space. You know, they kind of, uh, a lot of them are in fashion, a lot of the, there's a lot of self-selection that happens already at the kind of college level. So to uh, bring them out of their own body, I often send them outside into the street with some kind of prosthetic, uh, whether not a, a, a medical prosthetic, but some some <laughs> kind of but you could, um, some kind of idea that is extending their body, whether it's um, a big sphere that they have to somehow put under their clothing, or a wedge that they put on their leg, or you know whatever it is that brings them out of their own space, and then I send them out, and they have to negotiate familiar territory, the the neighborhood around the new school to um, see what it's like to physically negotiate spaces and then how people are looking at them in turn because they have, you know, it's kind of an Adrian Piper kind of thing of, you know, how people react to you when you change yourself in a, in a certain way. So to kind of get them out of their own mindset and thinking and developing really empathy for people who are not like them at all, whatever, you know, way that might be, and, and what that, that embodiment and the experience of embodiment can be so many different things. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think I'm so happy you're doing this work with the built environment because in our education courses, one thing, the students by now, they've heard about Brown v. Board a hundred times. Mm -hmm. They're almost desensitized to those pictures of, you know, no colors allowed. And they're like, yeah, I know that's what it was like. And even a more kind of, you know, next level of that, of the idea that, you know, to have like all white teachers in an inner city school, of course, it's going to be alienating to people of color. They kind of get that in a way that it's almost hard to, it's, it's almost for them like, you know, we've been there, done that. We read, when we read this article on the Fat Studies Reader about the way that desks can exclude people with fat bodies from the educational experience, they're like, oh, I never even thought of that, right? And so that, I think, is a whole other way of framing, like in, in that context, the educational experience as exclusionary to a category they never thought of as a category before. Yeah. Well, and so, oh, sorry. No, no, I just ahead. say, and also visually, like stock images that yeah. we mm -hmm. use all the time. So there's this thing called stockybodies.com, which, uh, mm -hmm. which is this idea of trying to build alternative uh, stock images for people who are fat that are not the kind of traditional, you know, headless, 
fat person, obesity epidemic news at five kind of construction of what fat is. Um, but you know, uh, I think it would be interesting for students, and what I was thinking of an assignment for this would be to have them create images for this and think about you know what other kind of images could exist, what needs to be out there that is not. Um, what images could be powerful and kind of help you know deconstruct this idea of what fat bodies are, uh, et cetera. It'd be a really um, interesting way to get them to engage and think about, and then also working perhaps with the fat model. It'd be interesting that whole negotiation too. What mm -hmm. what prejudices are they bringing that they didn't think that they had? You know, if, you know, uh, pushback from the model perhaps. You know, uh, it'd be interesting to kind of get them out of I don't know out of their own heads and out of this kind of. Uh, general constructions of fatness and obesity. Even uh, we had an interesting experience while uh, creating the, the flyer for the event. I don't know if you saw it. It's there at the entrance. So the first uh, uh, draft that was given to us was that text with uh, donuts <laughs> in the back. and. Uh, it, it, it was totally fine. This is, you know, one of our students working with us. But I found it very interesting because that shows how the sort of identification of weight and health is mm -hmm. so deep that that's sort of a, 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 an immediate reaction. So I saw that as like, well, maybe we can do something else. And so I proposed uh, a painting from Botero. I don't know if you're familiar with the artist. And then I passed it on to Leah, and Leah was like, oh, no. <laughs> so what, what happened after well, no, that? Well, no, because Botero's a lovely artist, has beautiful paintings. I've appreciated a Botero on many an occasion. <laughs> it's not I don't have an issue with the artist. It's that the image that was proposed, although a very lovely painting, was a nude, fat you know, woman, essentially. Uh, and I thought it was, first of all, then there was the Venus of Willendorf that was also uh, thrown in there too. But the idea that somehow fatness is equated with like past beauty, nude beauty, beauty that doesn't exist in the actual contemporary day that we all exist mm -hmm. in. Um, so I was eager to find an image that didn't, what wasn't a fertility goddess, that wasn't uh, you know, some, a, a nude that a man had painted. <laughs> Uh, that was a white nude and a cis you know, woman, essentially, depicted. Um, and to find something that really spoke about contemporary ideas and, well, let me say it again, constructions of fatness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we chose Cindy Baker's work, who you see on the pamphlet there. And that's actually um, a mascot that she had uh, made, custom made of herself. So she performs in the mascot costume, or did from 2008 to 2012. She went out and interacted with people, negotiated spaces that she might have personally um, negotiated you know, as, as just herself, but in this mascot guise, um, meeting people and, and essentially trying to not only think about the act of, you know, of the idea of fat embodiment, but also relating, you know, everyone wants to hug her and you know, see how happy and kind of cozy it looks. So this mascot being this kind of intermediary of her with other people. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's go a little deeper here. Uh, in this conversation, we already mentioned uh, queer studies, disability studies, but we also mentioned race, ethnicity. I would add age as an important factor. How these different aspects of contemporary culture interact with the concept of way, uh, fat, and health? Anybody who wants to start? Well, I guess to chime in on the age component of that, what I think is interesting and um, challenging to the dominant discourses. I mean, I guess first of all, it's important to say that in more recent epidemiological studies that are very large scale, it really challenges the idea that obesity um, is a health problem in and of itself. Um, and we see in a lot of biomedical literature, obesity is basically equated to a disease state mm -hmm. rather than a risk factor. Fact, they declared it. Yes, yes. right. Yeah. So, right. But mm -hmm. at the same time, one of the largest epidemiological epidemiological meta-analyses, about 3 million people, actually look at how um, 
some categories of overweight obesity measured by the very imperfect BMI, which we're probably all very familiar with, um, is associated with decreased uh, risk of mortality compared to quote unquote normal weight. Um, so there's a lot of challenges around that. But then also thinking about age and ageism, there's certainly a lot of implications for the ways in which people as they age are marginalized from society um, in this very ageist society. But at the same time, looking at excess weight, quote unquote, excess weight in older adults as being very protective for their health. And that being often marginalized or ignored in larger health discourses as well, mm -hmm. I think is an interesting issue when we are struggling with notions of youth and beauty that are equated to slimness as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, I actually don't even have like a pat analysis to make of this. But I've been, I'll just put it out there for you so you guys can go look at these images and tell me what you think. Um, but I think it relates to this idea of kind of youth and beauty and in many ways what is like, um, you know, almost like the impossibly attainable. So get ready for some high culture people. There's an Instagram account out there it's called <laughs> You Did Not Eat This. I don't know. Has anybody seen that before? There was an article about it in, in New York Magazine, which is how I saw it. And it's a, it's a woman, for, I, I, think, I think she's a woman, I'm pretty sure she's a woman, an anonymous woman. I think, from um, the kind of fashion world who saw that all of these like impossibly thin, um, you know, glamorous people, that the thing that they would do is that they would pose with like donuts or ice cream or like this really sort of um, rich, fatty food as almost another accessory. And she said, I'd go to all these fashion parties and I'd see like all of these like Wayfish women crowd around the dessert table, take their picture with their like macaroons and their fancy bracelets, and then like leave <laughs> the cookies and walk away, right? And I think, and she said, it just, it's like to me, she said to me that, um, you know, very um, decadent food, like the donuts that might have been on here, have now come to be on one end kind of associated with this like luxuriant, rich style, which is totally unattainable, particularly with pa when paired with these hyper thin bodies, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know, your question was kind of about intersections with contemporary culture. Like once, uh, hopefully like you'll leave here with this like changed framework. This is everywhere, right? <laughs> you can really um, start to interpret and see um, almost like so many of the images with which, I, don't, I was gonna say assaulted, but with which we encounter on a daily basis through this lens. And you can see the way that these ideas that we have really infiltrate everything from the most explicit, you know, stuff at the gym that you see to um, kind of much um, uh, things that might be m more subtle, but yeah, it is everywhere. Sorry, and yeah. just to, I guess, chime in on yeah. that, it makes me think of the advertising campaign from the Department of Health that's all over the subways and probably many of you have seen called Pouring on the Pounds, which are these images depicting, you know, bad foods, right, junk foods, foods that are moralized and um, with images of uh, fat and they're made to look very grotesque and to disgust you and raise that sense of disgust and it's clearly a moralizing um, <coughs> effort at imagery to, to reach people but at the same time is very stigmatizing, I would say. Well, mm -hmm. interesting, oh, oh, please, yeah. uh, you know, and, and fetishizing it sounds like mm -hmm. in a way but, but yeah. clearly there are, right, the the cronut, right, becomes this, you know, mm -hmm. maybe elitist, I don't know, <laughs> you know, but, but sugary soda, it, mm -hmm. you know, it becomes the, you know, right. and, and, you know, uh, the, the, the evil to end all evil, mm -hmm. so there's, the, you know, there becomes categories of, um, you know, fetishized uh, sweets and, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and evil sweets, um, mm -hmm. you know, that are class-based, mm -hmm. clearly, right. mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so, so bringing in that, that class dimension, but also, you know, that, that, yeah, because I've been talking about eating problems that also contribute to the sort of, uh, mm -hmm. as you were saying, then the cookie gets left, the sort of, you know, all or not and binge purge, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it, 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 it becomes so, for, you know, verboten, forbidden that, you know, that, that mm -hmm. one eats it in a particular right. way, you know, way, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'll, I'll turn it over and then mm -hmm. I'll come back and talk more about class issues. But, yeah, you know. mm -hmm. uh, No, I just wanted to add that, um, certainly the crossover between, say, queer theory and disability studies um, is this idea of what you were talking about now, mm -hmm. these kind of, you know, uh, cautionary tales mm -hmm. and the bodies that attend them, the idea of having to um, negate a body and the embodiment, the identity that goes along with it through illness, through mm -hmm. sickness, 
And I think therein lies a lot of the crossover between these different study, fields of study, that in queer theory, that in disability studies, there's a lot of excellent work that has been done um, thinking about how does one go about occupying a body, living in, an, in a body and, a, and living a valid sense of self and identity uh, when you're told that your body and your present self is in fact invalid, right? So the fat body as being the body that is always in process, the one that's you know never an occupiable body. It's always the the you that's within, right? That that isn't somehow in that body. So I think therein lies the crossover of kind of rejecting this uh, understanding what it is to queer something, mm -hmm. to to live in something that is non-normative, to uh, embrace things that are not the mainstream and see the validity in them as not being medicalized and not being sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think a actually now we have the image if you want. <laughs> yeah, I'll just put this up and you know, um, I was at the airport, I think I was in DC at the airport and came across this um, image that just seemed to encapsulate so much of what we're, can hear so much of what we're talking about. You know, for a variety of reasons. I mean, obviously, um, we, you know, we don't see, we, we see two, there are two kinds of bodies that exist in the world. There are very thin bodies and there are fat bodies. Very thin bodies are happy and they're social and they play with other people, <laughs> you know, and, and fat bodies are lonely. And of course, they're eating potato chips and, you know, and they're, you know, throwing things out of balance. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and we see chunky, hefty, big boned, you know, as uh, I think there's another sort of, discourse that happens that happens in a racialized way often I mean we don't see that as much so much here but um, so I've, you know in the medical literature mm -hmm. why don't uh, why don't African American women in particular um, see their children as fat I mean there's a whole mm -hmm. program of research that asks this question so I think that's speaking to chunky hefty big boned you know for parents of overweight children you know it's too easy to dismiss you know um, uh, in these sort of polite you, you know uh, ways um, is the message that um, which which ultimately is saying, I mean, you know, one way to look at that literature is saying that your way of seeing your body is not the right way, or your way of seeing your child's body is not the right way. We have the right way. I mean, this and this is what I think connecting up with what Leah was saying, the way medicine has, you know, I, and I think the way that queer studies in particular and disability studies are particularly relevant sort of intersections with fat studies because of the role of medicine in defining what is, you know, a, a normal body, a right body. Um, and and you know that that lens becomes the lens that we're all supposed to take up on how the body you know how we're supposed to you know live in our body act in our body um, and uh, and so both our behavior as well as our embodiment in other ways. Mm -hmm. And I mean, clearly here there is the the issues we're discussing are so deeply rooted into everyday discourse that it's not just enough to think and discuss it, but it also becomes. An, an issue of activism. Mm -hmm. How do you s see that connection working between scholarship and activism in these in these topics? Uh, well, I think, and as I've mentioned, it's the historian in me who looks, you know, kind of back at the way these the, these practices have developed. I see even bringing fat studies and fatness as a category of analysis as a topic of kind of um, uh, interrogation and not because of obesity studies, but because you're actually interested in the issues we're raising here. To me, that's already a kind of activist project in the mm -hmm. same way that starting feminist studies at many institutions like was getting people denied tenure at one point, right? So to me, I think there's that perspective, but then there's also like the interventions of like what I'm trying to do of going into schools and you know, getting out there in the world beyond these rarefied academic circles and trying to, um, you know, I don't even want to say spread these ideas, but have raise these questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, um, again, it's funny, as a clinician, you work so much at the individual level, so that is, you know, one, one point of, you know, of complicated activism in a yeah. way, you know, um, uh, to help people, um, you know, it, you know, and it, it's not always their agenda, and then you're trying to sort of figure out exactly the best way, um, uh, when and how and where and if appropriate. Um, but uh, so I think uh, that activism. Oh, sorry, I'm losing my. Uh, I think 
in a variety of ways. I, I, I'm overwhelmed because I've been sort of too much into this in terms of activism and trying to figure out where I am out of it. I'm wanting to hear actually from the art side and as well as the, 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 um, the some of the more uh, the, the mind body work because I think that a lot of the work that I have um, been doing has probably been more on the, the challenging this work intellectually um, and so uh, and activist campaigns with regard to that and and some of some of my earlier scholarship recognizing both when that works and also recognizing the limits of that. So then once we recognize the limits of, okay, so I've come to recognize when I engage in these, um, you know, uh, what, you know, uh, you know, this is what came up in one of in my master's thesis. Uh, so I so I recognize when I've internalized these ideas, when I'm projecting these ideas, when I'm acting, you know, uh, bringing these ideas on my own body. But um, but I still am carrying them with me. And how do I move beyond that? And so I think that that's, you know, I think that's where the interdisciplinary conversations are great to, ha you know, and, and projects are great to happen because I think that that becomes a place that I see a lot of the activism getting stuck. At least that's what I'm hearing from people. I, mean, I think similarly along those lines, and at least in my scholarship, the effort or the work is really around decentering this weight-focused notion of health. And certainly the public health and biomedical literature is a huge source of that. And, and as you mentioned mm -hmm. before, I mean, sometimes we're just so bound to and complicit in it because those are the sources of our funding mm -hmm. at times. But I think that what it really does, one of the damages it does sort of at the larger social level, at least to the health of the public, is that it erases the very critical aspects of context that make more visible issues of social justice, the issues of social and economic inequality, as well as the oppression of specific groups of people based on some physical aspect, whether it's their race, their age, their gender, or their body size. So I think that that work for me is really trying to produce and challenge those discourses in the professional literature where I'm coming from, as well as doing my absolute best to train clinicians who are more sensitive to, more reflexive, more engaged and empathic around the forms of stigma and othering that is so um, a part of an unconscious habit of privilege that is invisible to them when they begin their training in this area. Um, I think when it comes to activism, I can't speak for, I mean, I can say I participate a lot, in, I try to participate a lot in activism. I can't speak for the fact that activism and academia always uh, can walk hand in hand. And I think there's been publications by activists, especially fat activists, that have talked about the difficulty of working with academics. Um, I know that I try to bring in as many people as I can to my classroom who are engaged in that work, and especially the idea of activism, not even just in my own field of you know producing visual culture, producing design objects, uh, although it's very important, the idea of the kind of complete dearth of uh, um, adequate, say, you know, plus size clothing, the idea of people going out there and creating lots of independent fashion designers, creating clothing for themselves, for other people, doing a kind of you know grassroots idea of this does not exist, you know, as a larger kind of system. We're going to do that work. And so if people can dress their bodies the way that they want to, the way that they feel appropriate, not what you know Lane Bryant or some other you know fashion codes are telling them is appropriate. So there's that. Then, but then there's also the idea of engaging with activists who are working with their very real discrimination, legal discrimination that happens in this country as well. Someone like Marilyn Wan, who out in San Francisco, who's been working on literally making it illegal. Uh, to discriminate against uh, a fat person for their size. Um, so, you know, when it comes to activism, there are many different slices of that, and I try to bring those people into my classroom, whether it's through Skype or whether it's in person, you know, et cetera, so that their work can be shared and so that, this, you know, people are exposed to that as well. And, you know, as an academic, I do feel that uh, there is a, a, a core of activism, as we've been saying, this idea of getting these issues out there and discussing them and making them known and, and accepted, certainly. Um, but you know, there's, there's many different 
faces of activism, I guess. Yeah, and and I, I hate to say this because it's sort of a, de a depressing fact that the sort of, you know, fat hating diet industrial complex is so much a part of everyday lives that activism can be when you sit down with your friends, not having the default mm -hmm. conversation be like about how much you hate your body, mm -hmm. right? It can mm -hmm. be when, I mean, myself, I've mentioned, I've spent a lot of time in the kind of fitness space, teaching a class that never mentions a bikini body or working off what you ate last night. I mean, these are the kind of discursive norms mm -hmm. that shape our lives. And so putting the brakes on that and upgrading the conversation to something that you feel like, um, you know, ameliorates these issues is in itself, I think, a form of activism. So and we can all engage in. We're in a very young, raising, yeah. raising moment. You know, Absolutely. So, but I think it is exciting, and maybe this is one of the reasons it's exciting to be at the new school, you know, where these interdisciplinary conversations can happen, because I think you can have students in, you know, in a class for whom this consciousness raising spawn something like, yeah, a new way to do fashion or a new way. So the activism becomes not activism, right, but yeah. because but becomes, you know, doing their work differently. You know, which in some yeah. ways is some of the most I mean, you know, we need all different forms of activism. And, and I think that's some of the, the most profound activism. All right. We've been talking for one hour. I would open <laughs> uh, question and answers from uh, the audience. We have microphones. If you have a question, please use the microphone because we are taping the the discussion, and we want people at home to be able to hear all the questions. Hi. Um, I just want to say this is really interesting. And the, I want to ask one of you personally what the Fat Studies Reader is, is because I really want one. Um, <laughs> but I was also just wondering, there's a movie coming out, I think, in the next couple of weeks called Fed Up. And it approaches, again, now I want to put air quotes on it, but the obesity epidemic um, from a food studies point of view. And as someone who's very interested in food justice and food equality and access to healthy foods, um, I just was wondering what your perspectives on that movie were and on people who sort of peg themselves as food activists like Michael Pollan and, and things like that. I haven't, I haven't seen, that I haven't seen the movie yet, yeah. so I'm not yeah. able to... Uh, talk about that. And has anybody? I haven't seen it haven't either. Seen it. The preliminary sort of reports that I've heard from other folks is that while there's a lot of really wonderful intention of really drawing attention to issues of the food industry as being complicit in producing ill health, that a lot of what actually happens, again, from what I understand, what I've heard about the movie, is that there's a return to blaming the victim. The sense of reframing this um, issue of well, the problem is still the fat body. And letting off the hook the more powerful players like industry in the end. I'm not really sure about the nature of it. I, from just the buzz that I've heard about it, I refuse to pay to go to see it. It's <laughs> apparently that problematic from what I've heard, wow. but I will see it eventually. <laughs> um, but I've, I've heard really sort of mixed and com complicated sort of reports from the field about it. And I similarly won't comment on the movie, but mm -hmm. I think, uh, but 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 I wanted to say this earlier, so I'll say it now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think oftentimes that so you know the, we know thinking about the structural issues with regard to um, you know class and food, um, you know that we see you know, more and more films have have I think portrayed and understanding the sort of food studies perspective, access perspective. But I think what becomes um, missing from that conversation is the two you know, two pronged issue, which is that you know it, it, it we perceive this, you know, we come to perceive this as a one, one directional thing such that poverty produces, uh, you know, true. produces obesity and that's, mm -hmm. that becomes a discourse and we need to, you know, uh, end food deserts and certainly, you know, there, there are issues there. But actually we, we never talk about the opposite which is that discrimination produce, mm -hmm. uh, of fat people produces poverty and so that the relationship mm -hmm. between um, weight and poverty, uh, you know, is, is not a, you know, one directional phenomenon and mm -hmm. it's actually profoundly in the opposite direction. There's a lot of evidence in the mm -hmm. other direction, particularly for women that still is a bit of a gendered mm -hmm. issue. Um, I just wanted to say back to activism, although I really think staying on class stuff is very important, and I want to thank all of you. But just as long as we were on activism, I just wanted to put a bigger plug in for the new school in general, because 
the amount of activism here in the wellness center, all through spreading out, has been just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, you know, there's a real health at every size stance within the center, linking with different departments and so forth. Lisa, <laughs> all of you, and I think that's fabulous. And they've also um, allowed the group Endangered Bodies, which some of us here are activists on, to meet on the fourth Thursday <laughs> of the month um, in the counseling center at 85th Avenue. So we would love to have you and we, we do actions. <laughs> We're trying to change the world. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Just to respond to that, so the Health at Every Size movement, I'm so happy you brought that up because um, I, when I first sort of immersed myself in this literature, I was like on board, but look, I'm someone who exercises six days a week and I love it, not necessarily because of my weight, but that's kind of part of it too. And Health at Every Size is this, I think, wonderful movement and one of their principles is we acknowledge, I'll, I might butcher the phrasing, but we acknowledge that weight loss might be the outcome of a healthy lifestyle, but it's not the primary goal. And to me, that was like, yes, you nailed it, right? We are off in framing so many wellness programs with losing weight as the number one goal. It might happen. But let's not be so slavishly connected to that. So thank you for bringing that up. I agree. I had a, I had a question. Um, I'm a just recently retired physician. I really appreciate this conversation because it's kind of the conversation I've been having for the last 50 years with my patients. But I think what it, it's raised for me is the, um, you know, the fed up is a good, I liked it a lot. Oh, okay. And it's very political. And I think it does raise the fact that, and this is this issue that they get conflated, that our nutrition and what we've done to our food and what we're, children are fed and the kinds of foods that are particularly available in poor communities are really destructive. And that's so conflated with being fat and the, and the new, what your body size is looked at that it's really hard to unpack that. So I, I think the work you're doing is, is, is very important to sort of separate those because I was very, I work in the community a lot, just around the issues you're talking about, Christina, about mm -hmm. what are we going to do, though, as a community? What's the activism here mm -hmm. that's going to engage the political issues that have been so destructive mm -hmm. in ill health, just being embedded in the poor communities? So I, 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 I just wonder what your thoughts are, how you unpack those two because it's so equated right now. The issue of access to healthy foods? Uh, well, the poor nutrition, mm -hmm. the fact that most people agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Across the board, Americans have gotten a bad deal with sugar. And are that, that kind of nu nutrition, or corn sugar and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, but it's so conflated with body size now that it's right. really hard for people to even think about. I mean, I, I've had so many conversations with people about it's not your body size, it's these right. other things. Right, and I think that in at least some of the literature, there is a movement to look at more tangible health indicators like blood sugar, like lipids, cholesterol levels, like um, uh, blood pressure, and that these health indicators are ones that actually equate to mortality and morbidity, and they're more meaningful than just body size. A lot of the research that gets conducted looks specifically at BMI, and it's so abstracted. It's so abstracted from the community where diets are contextualized. It's so uh, abstracted from issues of race, class, gender, um, and other kinds of issues, and it gets so um, boiled down. And I think that the Health at Every Size movement is a really important addition to reframing public health and um, biomedical discourses to look at those things. Uh, at the same time, really trying to push people to, to go back to context, to re, um, reweave into the fabric of these studies the, the environments that are produced, the power that's at play in and around communities that have so been disempowered, who lack a sense of collective efficacy um, and are marginalized by different parts of society. And so, I mean, I think at least for me and my reading of it is really to um, try to decouple weight and health. And of course, 
access to healthy foods is really important for nutrition, diet-related outcomes in some ways, but it's also important for people's dignity and to have a sense that they're accessing food that respects their culture, that is affordable to them, that um, is appealing to them, and that they can get to uh, in a reasonable geography. And I think that when we um, get fixated on issues of, of nutrition and look at micronutrients, which again, of course, we, we understand are important, we kind of um, pull away from or um, start um, what one author calls the weapons of mass distraction, kind of put people's attention elsewhere where we um, can really engage in the politics of the possible and create strategies or interventions that look really great, that um, can be great newspaper headlines and that people can kind of rally behind, but I would wonder or suggest about the um, value of their long-term efficacy. And so that's that's the struggle, I think, that's still around there, but I think that's a great point. I think just um, as a coda on that, mm -hmm. um, is that the priority of health, you know, is a great thing, especially this uncoupling of health mm -hmm. and uh, and weight mm -hmm. is, uh, is a wonderful thing, but that it remains true that there are people who are unhealthy, mm -hmm. that no one needs to tick the box of health in order to be seen as a valid person. Mm -hmm. And that there will, the idea of putting health forward needs to always be cognizant of this, to not um, fetishize the idea mm -hmm. of, you know, health is the end all, health is the mm -hmm. end all. For a lot of people, you don't have a choice. And who, uh, if, you know, even if they do, the idea that you have to somehow prove yourself through your health is a dangerous road to go down. Hi. Uh, I have a question about um, the impact of, you know, the world we live in, the uh, kind of fat-hating society that we inhabit, and its impact on children. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I look at this. Uh, image up here, uh, case in point. Uh, I just remember as a young child, five or six, seeing like a program on PBS about the burgeoning obesity epidemic and the profound impact that it had on me. And uh, I mean, I've, I've been struggling with an uh, eating disorder all my life. Um, and I, I think of that moment as something that caused that to some degree uh, or put that idea in my head. And uh, so I just wanted to hear what you guys thought about how this sort of uh, stuff impacts kids and what we should be doing differently. Well, you know, ironically to the goals of those who, who use this kind of imagery to, um, to prevent um, uh, obesity, uh, it actually, uh, so I don't want to say this as if, you know, Using weight as a as an outcome, you know, but but to the extent that their goal is um, is to prevent this, uh, it actually increases it. So the more that obesity is stigmatized, you know, this thing that they you know is uh, defined as obesity is stigmatized, the more the more children who feel stigmatized, mm -hmm. the actually more likely they are to gain weight over the course of their lifetime. And so children who are bullied, um, ironically, who are called fat because kids have yet to fully reclaim the word fat. Probably it's, it becomes, I think, it's something we have to help people do earlier. Um, uh, yeah. So um, our our you know. They see you see you know more increase in weight over time. I don't want to say that that inherently is a bad thing, but it certainly goes counter to what those goals are. And we need to understand why that might be happening. Certainly, mm -hmm. because is it because now you're not even allowed to play with those kids? Um, you know what what or, um, you know what are the conditions? Yeah, these ideas are internal. I mean, there's lots of uh, you know research that shows that these ideas about kind of idealized bodies are mm -hmm. are internalized. Like even you know. Uh, before all, all of this kind of obesity campaigning very early mm -hmm. in ways that we're all complicit in, right? I was tonight on the way here and my four and a half year old son was saying, oh, mommy, don't go, don't go. And I said, well, you want to know what I'm doing? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm going to be on a panel where we talk about how fat is not a bad thing. And, you know, fat, we're trying to talk about fat differently. And he said, but mommy, you're going to be mean calling people fat. And I was like, wow, if my four year old is already believing mm -hmm. these ideas. So I <laughs> I think you know um, that uh, these ideas are internalized very young. And then there's now there was an article the other day in the New York Times about 
how there's debate about whether all this mm -hmm. emphasis on healthy eating is actually good for kids mm -hmm. or whether it can develop these um, you know, unhealthy attitudes and sort of fixation on food that we would hope wouldn't exist. I mean, as someone with a program devoted to talking about these <laughs> habits with children, obviously I'm a bit invested, but I'm also deeply interested in how what we can do better. Mm -hmm. My hunch is that like at what I identified before starting this program is that so much of this discussion that we have with kids is thinly about health, health right? Mm -hmm. Is thinly veiled fat hatred. So it's not surprising that that would breed, um, you know, problematic, uh, uh, relationships with food, but I don't think silence is really the answer. It's just sort of um, bettering our discourse or making it more culturally sensitive, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think reframing is a really yeah. critical piece. If we think about words like epidemic and yeah. crisis, they're yeah. so alarming more. and they really set the tone and we see it, you know, certainly in the academic literature, but across things like the New York Times. I mean, yeah. there's so much media, science writing that takes up and reproduces these feelings of fear and angst and crisis where um, I don't know that the science actually substantiates it, but also inadvertently reproduces more risk, more poor outcomes, especially with the diet industrial complex that people have talked about that as far as the evidence I've reviewed makes people a lot less healthy because it's unsustainable and it doesn't actually honor the fact that people have healthy weights at different places yeah. for their particular body. And so we're really kind of engaging in these problematic issues that I, I think would benefit a lot from the reframing that you're talking about. Well, and it's yeah. also um, consumer culture, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that younger and younger to address someone as a consumer, not as a citizen, right? Mm -hmm. You are trying to basically make someone feel alien in their own body so that you can sell that body back to them, whether it's through dieting, whether it's through beauty products, et cetera, et cetera. And these messages, I mean, that just combating that mm -hmm. yeah. is huge and so for so many different things and certainly for the notion of perception of your own body, feeling good in your own body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed the, this talk a lot. I come from a more scientific side of things and more medical oriented side of things. I saw Fed Up this morning. <laughs> and um, I, I, there are lots of things I could criticize about the film, but there's a lot of good things I could say about the film. And so I, it's playing over at East Village Cinema. If you're not objecting <laughs> to paying a small amount of money to go see it, I would recommend it. But just so that you can participate in the argument. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that what is inarguable is, is that for whatever reason, children, young children, are showing signs of heaviness, fat, whatever you want to call it, at ages and in proportion to the total population that was never seen historically before. And so there, there must be some explanation and it's not likely to be one that we would want to promote. Do we want to promote uh, being bigger? Is, is that a, a societal value that we want to promote? So we should understand from a biological perspective, if no other, why people are all of a sudden bigger. And so, from that perspective, I think it is very important to the degree that the food industry has be, is being blamed for a great deal of this, that we should take in great consideration what we put in our mouths and where that comes from. The food industry is not in the business of promoting public health. The food industry is in the business of making money. And therefore, there is no reason to imagine that something you buy off of a grocery store shelf, as opposed to something you make in your own kitchen, is going to be in any way better for you. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. We have time for maybe a couple of more questions. Um, I would just like to open kind of with that 
that comment we heard, maybe some of the panelists' um, opinion, given kind of the discussion of intersectionality that we've seen or we've discussed in terms of who allows things to go into people's mouths. Um, how are things culturally bound? How are things socioeconomically bound? Um, and I guess, so that's one question. Um, and then just a personal comment. I guess I'm wondering why is it problematic if bodies are bigger? Um, we're browner now, we're queerer now. We're more comfortable with disability now. And that's something that we're seeing as a shift in our society. So maybe, maybe we're cooler now with bigger bodies. But that's a comment, not a question. <laughs> no, the, the question of systemic issues, yeah, I think it's, the exactly, it's, mm -hmm. it's fundamental. And I think all of us agree on that. We cannot just look at an individual body mm -hmm. and just focus on that without looking at how, as uh, the lady here was mentioning, how that food got and what kind of food and what choices are, are made, who makes the choices, what are the dynamics behind that. I think that's very, very important. I, I work in food studies and that's one of the, I think one of the important elements that we try to introduce, especially working with students. We try to have them think in, in systemic ways. So it's not just the environment, it's not just health, it's not just body image, it's not just culture, but all the interaction and above all, what are the power negotiations behind, behind those things? And I must say that there is more and more literature uh, and interesting thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Problem is very often this literature doesn't go into you know, mass distributed media and the discourse there becomes a little more, more complicated. I, I wrote a, a short article to introduce this panel on the Huffington Post, and I must say it's been one of the, the, the articles that has, less, has had less interest. I mean, if you want to you know, measure interest with the likes and comments <laughs> and whatnot, and I found it very interesting in itself. I mean, the Huffington Post is very, open to anybody, but clearly the readership, uh, by the way, I published that on the health section mm -hmm. of the Huffington Post, so probably it didn't really meet the expectation of the readers of that, of that section, but I think it's interesting in itself. So, I mean, also the media become part of the systemic mm -hmm. thinking that I, it's very important. You consistent across the panel in terms of wanting to challenge the um, normative assumptions um, that underpin the social construction of the issues and ideas that you're discussing. And I think that's really important and to pass on the skills and tools for students to actually do that. What I found somewhat more disappointing though was the consistency of the conclusions that you drew, which seemed to be more akin to replacing a dominant view with your own view. Um, and so I was, what I missed was the self-reflexivity in your own analysis. And I wondered if that was one of the dangers, which in a sense blends academe with activism, that activism stops you being a critical academic. Because as you portray the ideas, you begin to believe them. I think this is a very important point. I'm disappointed that we have been perhaps disappointing in this regard, but it's critical to bring up if you think about the framing of any of the academic fields which have originated in deeply activist projects, that if you look at any of the kind of very early work in any of the fields that we studied here, some of it, yeah, of course, it, it does suffer, and we're probably guilty of it too, of having um, a a real ideological investment in, you know, what we like to think of as detached analytical work. And I don't mean, I'm not disparaging the rigor of anything that we're doing, but I do think that is um, a risk that 
one incurs and that happens with the kind of early, um, you know, formulations of these fields. So I think that's an, an absolutely crucial thing to be self-reflexive about. And I also wonder if, uh, because we feel like we're sort of speaking counter to what might be expected, you know, my guess is if you had individual conversations, and, and so, uh, which, which it's a problem if we're putting forward a unified front as if it, we do all come to the same conclusions, my, my guess is that we actually probably do think quite differently about different things. You know, and so, uh, so, so hopefully we can, you know, as the conversation pushes forward, as there's space to, to raise these questions, there's also space to come to different conclusions about it, um, where, yeah, so that, you know, in, in a variety of ways. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that there's probably very more diverse viewpoints that can be expressed across this developing field, but at the same time, time, it's uh, among the critical tools used to challenge more dominant discourses. And it's difficult to represent, you know, sort of the dynamic multivocality in, in this particular context. But I, I think that there's a, a richness there that um, would be wonderful to try to continue to express, if not in this particular moment. Our behind-the-scenes discussion, mm -hmm. even in organizing the mm -hmm. conference, mm -hmm. reflects some of yeah. the, you know, uh, the different discourses, the different places we come from. But also mm -hmm. the idea that um, yes, so mm -hmm. so there are many things that do not sit well with each mm -hmm. other. There are many mm -hmm. kinds of disciplines that do not agree on an intersectional, you know, anything. Right? There's a lot of things that that there's a lot of room for discussion within this. But having the room to raise alternate points of view is not a bracing in lockstep. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, having the room to actually say, let's think about whether this is actually true or who's behind this or how this is being constructed doesn't mean that I'm saying that's horrible. It's saying, let's take a, let's take a step back mm -hmm. and look at it as a system, look at it as a definition, see how it functions in society and then draw conclusions. I would never encourage my students to all feel the same way about something. And certainly there have been lots of discussions that I've had with students where someone says, I've had a student who said um, plus size clothing enables obesity and that's a bad thing. And we had a discussion about that. I would never shut that down, mm -hmm. but I would certainly discuss it and with the other students to kind of critically look at what is feeding each side of the equation. And I think this is a good point. Uh, unfortunately, time is running out, but the, the room will be available for a little longer. Uh, I want to thank everybody for, for coming and also for raising your questions. All very, very interesting. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing the, the video or maybe passing it on to other people, uh, it's going to be on the Inquisitive Eater, inquisitiveeater.com very soon. And if you leave us your names, we'll keep you uh, abreast with all the events we organize in the future. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, the panel on behalf of the uh, SOFAB Institute. It was certainly um, beautifully presented, very inspiring. And I hope that all of you will come and be on one of the panels that SOFAB Institute uh, presents. Um, we are very much into farm to table. We're working with a panel on honey because many of the chefs in New York, even Brooks Brothers, are raising honey on the roof to raise awareness on health through natural farming. So there, if anybody here is interested, I suggest you speak with Fabio and learn more about SOFAB Institute. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to share what we're doing so you certainly can and go to our website, and we hope you all will come in October when we do another event here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.